And there we are, live. Barry McGuire here. It's Monday. It's uh, Main Event Monday. I still want to call it Mainline Monday. And Donna gets so mad at me when I do that. But it's the Monday Main Event um, in Barry McGuire's Creative Real Estate Education Group. And uh, we're going to we're going to chat today about diligence, a subject near and dear to my heart. I've written books on diligence, or at least large papers. Diligence, uh, diligence is the is what you do when you're looking at a deal, and you're trying to decide: should I do the deal, or should I not do the deal? It's all the things that come under um, that umbrella. Things you look at, things you measure, things you investigate, people or the situation, paperwork that you get and review. Uh, all of those things can move toward this, this umbrella heading of what we call diligence. And then once you've accumulated enough data to uh, make a buying decision, then we say that you have done your, wait for it, done your due diligence. Due diligence. It's a word, word or words that uh, get bandied around a lot. I have done my due diligence, people say. Or I should have done more due diligence so it's uh it's enough data to to help you make a buying decision and of course that decision can be i'm going to buy the property or i'm not going to buy the property or i'm going to go ahead with the deal or i'm not going to head with the deal so that's that's kind of what diligence is and to help us out today we've got uh andrea workington we're going to get a little update on andrea and her uh ever-changing set of uh, professional designations that she has. That's pretty exciting what Andrea's doing. Uh, Neil Taniguchi, probably in lovely downtown Airdrie, just outside Calgary, be talking to us from there. Wayne Hillier, who's running the show uh, and who also gonna pitch in on diligence. So let's bring everybody in. We'll say hi and we'll uh, get going. Hey, Wayne, hey, Andrea, and there's Neil. So before we get going, I just want to hear from Andrea, just because I'm curious, Andrea, did I see that you now, on top of everything else, have your realtor's license as well? I do. Okay, you guys. Right. He's a pro with a ticket. Somebody asked me, am I going to get my mortgage brokerage? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I can't do that. <laughs> that was very funny. <laughs> well. But you are a licensed property manager, aren't you? As well. I am, but they kind of yeah. work well together. Those they two. do. They do. Mm -hmm. Realtor and, and property manager work well together. And uh, Neil, you're uh, outside enjoying some air. It looks like, or is that you? Just your uh, is that your green screen we're looking at? <laughs> it's a uh, it's a real virtual non green screen, and we're not in Airdrie. We're still stranded on the island. I'd like to say stranded, which makes it mean that we can't get home. But yeah, I suppose we can. So yeah, we're here for uh, roughly till the end of the month. Okay. And uh, then we'll make our way back. Right. So yeah, str I guess stranded on the island, stranded on Vancouver Island is not really that much of a <coughs> penance, is it? I mean, not. Could be a lot here to be had. <laughs> and Wayne, uh, you're looking all uh, professional today, wearing a jacket. Uh, you must have like had some meeting you were going through or something. Uh, don't, don't be fooled. It's, it's sweatpants underneath here. <laughs> I, get that. I, I get don't that. leave my house as much as uh, Neil. I mean, Vancouver. Wow. That's exotic. I haven't, I don't leave my office very much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, now that we hardly have any COVID, we'll just, we'll all be able to go out right away, I guess, pretty soon. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Hey, I've had my, uh, I'd like to tell everybody, I've had my first shot. So uh, partly that's because I'm an old guy and I fit in one of those old guy categories. But quite frankly, I got it and I, I'm happy about that. I, I have to say I do feel better. So it's coming. I hear we're getting a whole bunch more doses this week. And so, yeah. All right. Enough of the preliminaries. Let's talk some more. Uh, let's talk some more about uh, about diligence. And I'm going to start off with, uh, with just... With just the basics, let's not worry about exotic kinds of diligence. Let's just talk about uh, a scenario where anybody watching or any of us is going out to buy, let's start with just a plain single family home. Just a single family home in a subdivision. You're looking at it, looks like it might have some, um, some possibilities for you. Um, 
I mean, the, the one piece of diligence that I recommend everybody get every time is that once they are ready to write an offer, you know, once you're ready to write an offer, you're pretty sure you like the property, you're going to write an offer. I say, get a, get a title search, get a title search and read what's going on there. Wayne, who are we waving at? Is that Everly? Yep. She brought me a coffee. Oh, what a good girl. A good girl. AKA vodka. <laughs> All right. I get a title search. I, I go online to the uh, Alberta land titles office. I log into, I think this thing called spin Two. it's their website. And they make it pretty easy for you to punch in a, a legal description and uh, you can order a title search. And so I look at the title. I want to see uh, if the name of the person on the title is the name of the person that I think I'm dealing with, the name of the seller. I want to see this there. I look to see what's registered against the title. I like nice, clean titles. Ideally, there wouldn't be anything on the title, not one darn thing registered against it. But often there is uh, a mortgage, and usually that's just the seller's mortgage that it will disappear when you buy. Uh, sometimes there's a second mortgage. Occasionally there's a third mortgage. And here's what I've never seen before. Um, in our in our law office, we get a list every day of new files that are being opened up. And I, I saw a file that was getting opened and I was a little bit interested in it because I knew something about the, the names. And um, I called the lawyer in charge and we are representing, are you ready? The fifth of six mortgagees on the title. There are six mortgages, different, six different mortgages with six different lenders. I'm not even gonna go into it. It's, it's not a single family home, it's a different kind of property. But uh, if there is a, um, a second mortgage or a third mortgage on the title, one a piece of, of uh, diligence that uh, and information that I get from that is I look at those mortgages registered and I add them up. How much did a first mortgage uh, mortgagee lend? How much did a second mortgagee lend or a third mortgagee? I add up what the land title says those mortgages were originally. And I look to see if whether or not the, the price that's going to be paid for the property is enough to get rid of the mortgages. Every once in a while, it isn't. And then you got to start poking away at and ask questions. Uh, other things on a title, there might be... Um, Notice that a judgment has been registered against the seller. In other words, the seller has been sued and somebody's won that lawsuit and they put a judgment against the title. Uh, there might be um, other notices of lawsuits when people are getting divorced and only one of the parties is on title. Some, sometimes the non-title party registers um, notice that they're suing. And if you know sellers are getting divorced, that can be a really useful uh, piece of diligence. Uh, airport zoning regulations, restrictive covenants. Uh, restrictive covenants are what they say. Restrictive means it means that something can't be done with that property. Whoever's buying it does not have free reign to do whatever they want. And restrictive covenants are usually put on by developers, saying that oh, you got to have this color of shingle and this kind of siding, and you can't put RVs in the driveway. And, uh, you have to build a property that's this many square feet, that kind of thing, which normally isn't a problem. But, you know, about one out of 25 restrictive covenants has something in it that would affect me as a buyer. And so I read those restrictive covenants. Utility rights of way, say, where the um, where EPCOR and NMAX and the cities can put their various bits of utilities. And if you're planning to do a big uh, development on the property, you want to know where those utilities are because you can't build over a utility right of way. Mm -hmm. So that's a basic title search. Basic? Uh, okay, sorry, that, that is, that's a title search. Title search is a basic search. Okay. It didn't sound title very basic. basic there. <laughs> but um, one, thing about, one thing about diligence is when we say, if you're buying a property, you should look at the title if you're serious about making an offer. Um, key part there is look at the title. Don't just tick it off your list and say, okay, yeah, the checklist said get a title search. I've got it. Okay, what's next? you got to look at the title and you have to analyze it for what might be on it that could be interesting or could affect you. 
Whew. So um, let's go over to Wayne first. Um, Wayne, if you're buying a single family property, apart from a title search, what other diligence might you do? RPR. RPR, which is for all those people that don't live in Alberta is a real property report. Okay, so that is what lots of other provinces call a survey certificate. Mm -hmm. And we used to call it a survey certificate. And Wayne, what's an RPR or survey certificate? Why is it important? Uh, well, like you said, it's a survey. So what they, you hire a survey company to basically um, do a drawing of the property. So you know where all the property lines are, you know where the building, how big the building's supposed to be, if there's any um, attachments, um, additions to the property, and, you know, that'll be outlined there so you can measure that decks, uh, fence lines, driveways, maybe no garages. Uh, what's any, any lines that are going through the property. I think that's, that's on there as well. Uh, sheds, just it, basically it's a decks. If I said that, I can't remember if I said that basically just a whole picture of the whole property so that you can go and verify that everything is there that's supposed to be there. Um, because if there's a, say, an addition to the property that's not on there, you know, you want to ensure that there's a permit in place uh, for that addition or that deck. So it's a big deal. So, so that is that is right. Um, uh, so it's an interesting um, it's an interesting point about about RPRs. I think I think that Alberta is the only province where the standard purchase contract used by all the realtors says that the seller has to supply the real property report and this other thing called evidence of municipal compliance. So municipal compliance is the RPR going to the local municipality and they look at it to see whether or not all of the improvements on the property are located according to the city rules and bylaws. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing they do. And also they look at it to see if uh, if it shows that there is a house and a garage, uh, they look to see whether or not permits have been issued for the house and the garage. Um, so I think in, in many other provinces, the contract says if the seller has a survey, he has to give it to the buyer, but it doesn't say he has to provide it like the, like the contract does in Alberta. So if you're looking at a single family home, uh, the survey or a real property re report comes becomes very important if you are, uh, firstly, to know that everything is done according to what the city says. Secondly, it's important if you're planning to do something with the property. Let's say that you want to put an addition on the existing home. Well, the city will have rules about um, how uh, how much of an addition you can put on. So they usually say, if there's a house in a garage, there has to be a certain number of meters between the house and the garage. And if you want to put on something that goes five meters into that space between house and the garage, you have to know that the city rules allow you to put an addition on that goes five meters in, or can you only go three and a half meters? You also want to know um, uh, the square footage of the, of the lot, because again, city rules often say uh, on a lot of this size, you can only put a dwelling of this size. Bigger the lot, usually the bigger the dwelling that you can put on. So um, uh, a survey or real property report is very important when you're buying a single family home or, or a, even a commercial property, depending on what you want to do with that property. All right, so that's a title search and an RPR. Andrea, do you have any other uh, searches you do if you're looking at a single family home? Do you, do you mind if I cut in real fast? Because uh, George had a question in regards to the title. I think it was in reference to you uh, reviewing the title. He asked, do you charge a fee, Barry, for providing that service? Or do lawyers charge fees? Uh, if I'm if I'm helping the client buy the house, I wouldn't charge a fee. It's, we get a title search and look at it. But um, the time to, and I, sorry, this is a complicated answer. I usually only see deals once they're done and unconditional because realtors are usually working on the deals and I don't get involved in the consulting. So I don't have an opportunity to look at the title before the contract goes unconditional. Uh, occasionally though, people call me up and say, Barry, I'm looking to buy and I need some help putting together the offer. 
then I uh, get a copy of the title for them and I review it as part of whatever consultation I'm doing uh, other than closing the deal down the line. So there we go, Andrea. <laughs> what was your question? Do I look at anything else on the title? Yes. Yeah, so, or for single family houses. So um, one of the things that, uh, how, them um, is you have to make sure you scratch that out on the contract. So when you're doing your own contracts, if you forget to, to scratch out section 10.2 of the, of the Alberta contract, then it can cause issues at closing because people didn't realize the seller has to provide one. <laughs> so I always like to have that conversation ahead of time. And the other thing that is important to know, which may not be on title, is if dower rights apply. So essentially, um, you need to make sure that you have all the decision makers. So a typical example would be is, say, a gentleman buys a house and lives in it for a couple of years and then meets a nice lady and they get married. But her name's never been on title. And when you go to sell, she has to sign off on certain forms. So especially when it's something contentious like a divorce, you really need to know, um, especially on the creative side of agreement for sales, you need to know uh, who has an interest in the property. So even though that dower right may not be listed on the title, you need to ask the question. Yes, uh, that uh, that's a classic. I mean, it really is a classic and it comes up it comes up right away, right when you start looking at the property, whether you're doing that by yourself and you're and you're looking uh, at for sale by owner properties or whether you're working with a realtor. Uh, if there's only one name on the title, you have to ask the question is, you know, is the title holder married? And if the title holder is married and if either of those folks have ever lived on that property at any time since their marriage, then here in Alberta, the non-title spouse has this thing called dower rights, which means they have to sign off on the deal or it's or it's not going ahead. So um, good to get that out of the way right at the beginning. And I know that's part of part of what realtors do now and they didn't used to do it, but they do, I think, have to get that done at the listing stage. And then the contract itself has a place for the spouse to sign off. And so in Alberta, the non-title spouse gets their rights from a piece of law called the Dower Act. But uh, different provinces have different ways of handling this. And I think most provinces take into account uh, what happens if only one name is on the title, but that one person is married. So if you're not in Alberta, uh, you need to figure out in your province how that gets handled and how you would investigate. So Dower is, uh, Dower is important. I was going to say, Mary, it's not just married because if they're recently separated and recently can be as far back as five years, um, sometimes you still have single name on title and you have to make sure that it's not part of a separation agreement or that it maybe they're separated and they actually haven't been legally finalized yet. So even though they're not on title, an ex may still have a right to claim and, and that sort of thing. Too, so not just married folks, subtle difference. Um, you know, I don't know about that part, Neil. I, th I think I think part of what you're saying is certainly true. Uh, people often think, uh, so people who are married, so we have one person on title, but that person uh, is legally married. However, they've been separated for a while. In fact, they are deep into their divorce negotiations but the divorce isn't finalized yet and so the you know the answer to the question are you married the answer is still yes and so if the answer is at the time the deal is going ahead yes i'm still married then the dower stuff still has to be uh, still have to be taken care of the the other the other component of that that's a different provincial matter is that uh, what we all used to call common law, people who are not married, but they're living together, we say they're in a common law relationship. Now in Alberta, what we say is people are in, are you ready? This is so much classier than common law. People are in adult interdependent 
relationships, <laughs> adult interdependent relationships. And so uh, recent legislation here in Alberta anyway has increased the rights of people in those adult interdependent relationships up to the point where it's almost equal to, to being married in terms of what happens if you're getting divorced or separated or uh, who's paying who when, when you don't live together anymore. So again, if you're in a different province, you need to check to see uh, how your province deals with one person on title that's married and do they do anything different about adult interdependent relationships? Because man, you don't want to find out that they're having a battle just when it's time to close the property because it could all get held up. Phew. Wow. That's just single family and we're not even talking revenue yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Uh, other things on, on, on single family properties uh, are, uh, now let's say you're looking at buying a single family property and you want it uh, because uh, you want it to be a revenue property. So there's the situation of you want to add, say, a secondary suite. Let's not talk about laneway suites or garage suites or any of those things. You just want to add a secondary suite. We all used to love to call it basement suite. So you want to add a secondary suite and, and there's nothing in the basement right now. It's just concrete and rafters, trusses. There's nothing there. Or there is a suite in the basement that uh, the seller says, you know what? I just put it in. I never got permits. Uh, I've rented it all this time. Kind of up to you whether you buy it or not. It's the rare seller who would be as candid as that. But nevertheless, let's just say we have a seller who's kind of honest. Or, or that the uh, seller says, yep, brand new legal secondary suite. And so you, uh, in all those cases, have some more poke, poke, poking or more, more diligence to do. So on the first, if it's, uh, Neil, I'm going to go to you on this one. Let's say it's, it's the nice clean basement with the concrete floor and, and the trusses, nothing on the walls. There's nothing down there. And you're thinking about putting in a secondary suite. What do you do? Um, in that case, you'd want to check the zoning and compare that um, to the municipality or the city, what their bylaw states for usage. If a secondary suite is a permitted, as in allowed um, development within that basement, or in the case of where we live in Airdrie, secondary suites are a discretionary uh, usage, which means that it's not an automatic approval even if you meet all of the parameters required for approval, they send the letter out to the neighbors and I'll, and I'll back that up a sec. As an example, if you wanted to build a new deck on your property, as long as it was within the size parameters that the city had set and, and height restrictions and all those uh, parameters, if it met the parameters, you get a stamp of approval, not a stamp, but a permit from the city and your neighbors really can't, do anything about it, so to speak. There's no um, process to try and protest or have that approval overturned. In the case of a discretionary use on a bylaw, um, they send a letter out to your adjacent affected neighbors and they have a period of time, again, mandated by legislation as to how long it is to then officially lodge their protest and appeal the approval if they want. Ask us how we know. So. Again, depending on where you are, I know that Calgary and Edmonton and Red Deer, and I believe even Lethbridge, again, we're all Alberta based here, have some fairly liberal sweet um, approval processes right now in place. Calgary's has been extended to the end of 2021, for example, and some of them allow you to go back and look at if there was ever an existing suite in that property and grandfather you to some of the older uh, building codes. So if you're in another jurisdiction, you would want to check to see if there had been a suite in there previously. And if that's the case, you may not have to go the full gamut of required building code upgrades. For example, uh, here in Alberta right now, the code is for a 36 inch um, window well, if it's below grade, which is an upgrade from the old 30 inch one. So if you were grandfathered, you wouldn't have to change your window wells. If you're not grandfathered, you'd have to pull out a perfectly good 30 inch well and replace it with a 36 inch well. So you want to check zoning for sure. 
So zoning is really important to, and to understand that, uh, that often there are permitted uses. You can just do it, nobody can say. And discretionary uses, whereas Neil says the neighbors get can get notice of and, and the development officer has some discretion as to whether or not to allow the permit. Um, the other part about uh, a secondary suite is uh, an area might have the zoning that would allow such a suite, but then as you dig into the rules around getting permits, there are, there's, there's lots of safety code and other building code things that you have to be able to meet. So for instance, if, uh, just to use one example, if the ceiling height in the basement was say only six feet, and I'm just pulling numbers out of the area because I, I don't know, a ceiling height could be six feet and the, and the bylaw could say that ceilings have to be at least six feet, six inches. And I'm using feet and inches because I'm still more comfortable in those things. So, uh, it, you know, if you're buying a house where it's a six foot ceiling and the city wants 6.6 .6 or six feet, six inches, that's going to be really tough putting a secondary suite in there. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's not why uh, one is one is in there. So uh, yeah. permits. Wayne, do you have something there? Yeah, I got a few other examples, too. I thought you were going to talk. Well, there's two things I was thinking about when it came to secondary suites. I feel like we can do a whole hour on secondary suite due diligence, though. There's so many things you need to look into. But uh, I thought you were going to go with the Calgary airport area, um, the area around the airport that right. even though it's I, I'm not 100 percent, it's not my market, but it's zoned for it. But for some reason, if you're in that line of where the, the, the or area the, near the airport, you're not allowed to have secondary suites. Yes, uh, the the Calgary airport zoning regulations specifically say now all right i'll just finish it they specifically say that you can only have i believe a single family dwelling in any any uh in any home that fits within the airport regulations yeah. so they you know they have a big designation of what pieces of land are affected by those res regulations and um we did uh, i think the example we looked at a while ago was uh, somebody looked to to uh, buy a property in the area. They called the city to say, uh, what about the zoning? And the city said, I think it was one of the rare spots at the time in Calgary that you could. A secondary suite was a permitted use or at least a discretionary use. So the city was all on board, uh, but turned out the, the airport zoning regulations, which are federal, wouldn't allow it. So yeah. that's a bit of obscure diligence, but certainly one that these folks who who found out and and dug deep and and got that piece of diligence uh, didn't go get a permit from the city and and put in a secondary suite at huge expense only to find out they might have to rip it out. So uh, the other the other example I have was when it came to grandfathering in suites um, in Edmonton, for example. I actually have a story of an investor that I know who bought a property, said legal suite in the MLS listing and everything. Uh, legal suite, he bought it. And then he noticed a few months later, hey, there's stickers on this furnace. And so we called up the realtor and says, yeah, I mean, they said it was legal and he never went and actually checked. So when he went to go check, calls up the city and says, hey, I want to see that there's a permit on this property. There's no permit. And so what they ended up finding out, because he's stressed out now, he's over in his mind, he's overpaid for this property now. He's like, this isn't even a legal suite. But what he found out is that suite was grandfathered in and the city of Edmonton doesn't actually keep record of properties that were grandfathered in. So he had to go and call the fire department to find out if they had issued something. So, you know, it's a little different when, when you're looking for secondary suites. It's not as simple as just a sticker or calling the city. You actually got to go a little bit deeper to find out if it actually was indeed grandfathered. But he's, yeah, so he, he got pretty stressed out on that one. <laughs> oh, no, you know, but that's, but that's true. I mean, when you're, when you're working with things that have been grandfathered. So grandfathering really means that the situation was legal at another time under a different bylaw. Then the bylaw changed. And if they were looking to do what today, what was done before, it might not be allowed. So, so yes, you can find grandfathered suites. In Edmonton, we also have houses that come under what's called safe housing, uh, which are... Uh, structures that have typically three or more rooms or suites in that when the last big bylaw change was done, all those 
kind of got stuck under this thing called safe housing, which is supposed to continue to accumulate and protect um, uh, suites for lower income folks. And uh, so that's a whole different sub registry uh, where, I mean, we had David Coughlin on where he bought a safe housing suite, a fourplex that had two, uh, two suites on the, on the upper floors and, and three bedrooms in each basement that were allowed to be rented out separately. And I think a lot of people passed on that because they thought it was illegal. And David turned that into a $3,000 a month cash flowing piece of gold. Well, so, oh yes. Thanks Donna. And David's going to be on next week following up on that great deal that he got uh, with uh, a number of comments on how he's improved it from uh, Three thousand dollars a month positive cash flow. Okay, I'm not going to say anymore. It's so good. I just—it's the best deal ever. <laughs> it's just the best deal ever. Investor spotlight update. Yes. Wow. Thank you. Don is my producer here, and she's uh, just keeping me up to speed. Um, what else on? What baby? Watching for questions. There. You know, I, there are apparently quite a few questions. Wayne should let's answer a few before we move on and. People will forget. Well, someone had reached out um, as an extension to what I was saying and, and asked how or where would I check on the, that status of grandfathering. I just spoke with someone who said he was sure he had received a paper some years ago about being grandfathered in, but now he has been putted and needs to sell his home or make it a legal suite. So he doesn't know where to find out if it's actually grandfathered because he can't find the document. I think he means he's being punted. Possibly. <laughs> or... But, but in any event, um, so, so yes, I think more in days gone by, um, if there wasn't, if the seller hadn't actually applied for permits and if they didn't actually have it in their hands, there used to be a lot of flim flammery and chicanery and nasty hiding of what was really going on with a property. Uh, and you could see it in the adverts, um, in-law suite, uh, extra revenue, uh, you know, those are code words for there's a basement suite. And, and so when you, when you say to that seller, all right, so is there, uh, is this a legal suite? He goes, well, uh, I'm not really sure, but I, I think it's grandfather. I think it's grandfather. And if you don't poke away at that and buy on that basis, you find out that it wasn't grandfathered, meaning it used to be legal under a different bylaw. Yeah. and isn't legal now, but you are grandfathered, you can allow it to stay the way it is till some, uh, till the use of it changes. So I'm expecting that probably it, it hadn't been grandfathered and there really was no proof at the time. So that's the point about diligence is that you need to get the answer to the question. It, you can never accept, well, I think it's, or I'm pretty sure, or I remember that, you need the actual proof to whatever the question is that we're trying to answer. So I think that's that's that one. What else we got for questions? Yeah, we had one earlier here. Um, uh, Lewis had said, uh, hello, new here. So welcome. Uh, with that title search, when we were talking about title searches in the very beginning, uh, would that title search tell you if the place, let's say a side-by-side -side duplex, is legally divided into such a side by side, or it was supposed to be one big unit only. Uh, all right, Andrea. Well, I've got to give it to you. You're you're <laughs> you're the brand new realtor. You probably had to learn about all these things just like you know two weeks ago. So, what do you think the title search would say about a side by side duplex and whether it had a title to each side? Well, um, on the title, it should say one address or two <laughs> or multiple lots on it. So when you look at the title, it should tell you the the plan block and lot or if it's a condo, it would have the condo on there. Um, so when you look at that, it'll give you the title gives you the legal description for either the whole building or one. <laughs> so um you should be able to figure that out another way that you can do it is look at property taxes so uh, i'll give you an example because i have a duplex down in the little old town of nobleford it has two addresses 819 and 815 it has two gas meters 
but it has one title. Mm -hmm. So yes. on, it has all the, the legal description of the whole entire property, not two halves of it. Yes. So, um, so those are, those are all things that you can do. If you, if you have a duplex that you're looking at some other things that would come up that, um, you know, that might help you are, uh, if it's a side by side duplex, usually, um, when the duplex is being built, it, they have to pay special attention to the wall that goes down the middle, dividing it into two units. They have to put uh, special insulation in there and, now there are environmental um, regulations and rules that they have to meet for noise abatement in some newer properties. Uh, but there is often registered against the title, this thing called a party wall agreement, party wall agreement. And the party wall is to uh, let the two parties who might own the two sides um, repair or get access to the parts of each unit that they might need to do to, to keep their unit in repair. So if I'm on side A uh, and there's a party wall agreement, it would allow me to access and go in through side B if there were some, pair, some repairs I had to do. So you can look for party wall agreements. Um, I, the, I think probably the, the best way to find out whether uh, a duplex has one title or two is to ask for that real property report because the surveyor will will draw a picture of the duplex and he will if you're and if you're looking to buy one side of it it'll show the one side but it'll show it's one side of a duplex so uh, that's how it is in in Alberta and again we're, we're speaking to people across the country so for all of these questions you need to kind of update yourself with your local realtor and your local lawyer uh, if you have any of these issues that you need to sort out uh, any other questions there, Wayne? One more. One more. Okay. Uh, do you need to worry about consequences to a seller if you make inquiries with the city and they take action based on a non-conforming suite? Ooh. Neil, what do you think? What do you think? So you're looking to buy, there's a suite. You go, so at 10248 95th Avenue, uh, I want to know if that suite in the basement's a legal suite. What do you think the city might say if they look that up and go, no, doesn't show on our records? Um, so to answer, I think what your question is, Barry, the proper way maybe to phrase that question to the city would be, I'm wondering if you can tell me if there are any development permits that have been issued for this particular property which may be a way to not flag a property, so to speak, that has an illegal suite, yeah. but find out if it actually has a legal one or not. And again, that's why, again, in the world of diligence, we definitely want to be making sure that we're not taking someone's word for it. We've all heard of those situations where someone, yeah, 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 it's legal, don't worry about it. And hmm, you needed to worry about it because someone was misinformed or flat out, you know, unfortunately lying. And I don't know, if that what the consequences to the seller are to answer Aileen's question, uh, that would be more, I think it at the real estate board and or lawyer level. I haven't personally been involved in one where we bought something on a bad promise. So I might flip that ball right back to you, Barry, to say legally, is there a, con is there a, a recourse for a buyer if, if a seller lies to you or misinforms you or Andrew? If uh, well, Certainly there would be recourse if you bought the property on the seller's promise that it was a legal suite. Um, Let me wrap that up. What, what if it was a verbal promise? Well, th there's something. So what, what the law says from what I read in the course, <laughs> essentially, if it's public information and it's something that you can easily do, even if you don't know that you should do it, <laughs> the seller's not liable for it. So things like checking the title, phoning the city, asking about permits and that type of stuff, that's all public kind of information. And so uh, a seller doesn't have to disclose anything that's public. Am I right, Barry? Like it, Yes, if it's, if it's easily discoverable, they don't have to specifically tell you about it. And now I think if you directly ask them, if, yes, if then, you ask as part of and they lie, that's a different story. 
but they don't have to go telling you everything that you can find out on your own. And this also leads to a, a slight sidebar issue, but it's an important one that I didn't really realize until I, I did my education. Um, something called material latent defects. So if you know that uh, your basement floods every spring and you're not in a floodplain, because if you are in a floodplain, again, that's uh, a public document. There, there's a website you can go to to find out if the house is in a floodplain. And so again, that becomes easily discoverable. But a material latent defect is something that you can't see and something that a home inspector wouldn't be able to find um, through their home inspection. So you as a seller have to disclose that. Now, if you're found to not disclose it, then you can be sued. Right. No, that's, that's true. Material latent defects are now part of the Alberta real estate contract. And they, they weren't for many years. They weren't for many years. I mean, I think the, I think the, uh, I think the rule was that if there were latent, so latent means things that you can't easily discover as opposed to patent. Patent defects are ones like there's a giant hole in the roof as you drive up. That's a patent defect. The seller doesn't have to say, look at that big hole in my roof. I'm, I'm disclosing that to you. Uh, so the, the, the latent defects are like Andrea says, if the, the house floods, if there's a big rain or in the spring, the, the house floods, um, that you, you don't really know. I mean, maybe the inspector can see it because he can see water damage downstairs, but for hidden things, the sellers are supposed to, um, they are supposed to disclose those things. Now, uh, again, I, that's a that's a fairly new addition to the Alberta contract, and other provinces may not have similar um, uh, similar contracts. So, if you're in a, a different province or even here, I mean, Andrea, I don't know if they taught you about uh, a buyer who would come along and uh, put in their offer as a as a term uh, seller to you know review. Uh, any issues that they know are pretty big or small, which might impact the, the buying decision. Um, I don't think any realtor wants to see that kind of a clause show up. But, no, it's uh, you know, in the listing agreement. So if you're listing with a realtor, it's in there. You There's a place for the seller to disclose uh, any material latent defects. And we actually have to go through that with them and explain what it is. But, you know, a lot of times as investors, we're buying for sale by owners, especially when you're using seller financing, you're worried just about explaining how it works. You don't even really do much about the house and saying, oh, by the way, do you know what a material latent defect is? And do you have any? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so I think that it's an important thing to bring up and people in their own province should do their own research on material latent defects and whether it has to be disclosed or doesn't. Because the little twist on that is if you have a material latent defect and you fix it, you don't have to disclose it. But on the other hand, they do recommend that people still disclose it and disclose how it was fixed because what if it never solved the problem? So here's a good example, perhaps. So let's say somebody had an older house that had no weeping tile in it. And so they bring in like basement systems of Calgary and they put in, you know, their little channel on the inside of the house. And so you think it's fixed, but what if they missed something and it's not fixed, right? And it's also important to know. So if somebody like basement systems of Calgary guarantees their work as a lifetime thing that this place will never flood again, we need to know if that guarantee passes on with the sale of the house. Any warranties or guarantees? Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's an important uh, that's an important consideration, and that's part of that's part of from the buyer's perspective finding out what's going on about the property, and from the seller's perspective, uh, it's kind of a form of diligence. And you're sitting around saying, "We listed the property. You know, the place used to leak like a sieve every time it rained, but we got that weeping tile put in, and we've got the guarantee." And uh, well, it's been dry as a bone for the last five years. So uh, as you say, Andre, if the problem is fixed, if that material latent defect is no longer a defect because it's fixed, you, you don't have to reveal that because it's not a defect anymore. But on the other hand, uh, 
you can cover yourself off probably uh, from future action by revealing it when you sell and passing on the guarantee if there is one. And then people, the buyer buys with a full set of information and it would be extremely difficult for a buyer to come back later and go, hey, you didn't tell me because you did. So uh, sellers are always a little edgy about saying that. And I think maybe part of it goes to their concern about whether or not the defect is really fixed. But uh, as always, disclosure is always better, isn't it? It is. We, we believe in disclosure. We believe in disclosure. Um, what's he going to say? Home inspections. Neil, what's your position on home inspections? There was a question, but it's gone there, so we'll catch it as soon as Neil talks about home inspections. Um, I think the question, because I saw it flash across, was what's the time period that you can go back to the seller for a latent defect? And my quick answer, George, on that one is it's likely a provincial statute as to how long you can go back. Uh, I believe in Alberta, Barry, you can tell us this. We have two years to sue if we find something. Two but years. Nova Scotia, maybe something completely different, George. Um, yes. So. I, in Alberta, we have something called the Limitations Act. And it says how long you have to, to bring in action in a particular circumstance. And Andrea, I just can't remember. Is there something in the contract that says how long the seller's warranties last? I can't remember whether that's... That's a great question, and I don't know the answer. Sorry. The answer to that, but it. But again, it's it'll be a provincial. Uh, it'll be a provincial situation on how long after closing that you get to that you get to sue. And so, uh, George, if you bought last summer, well, it's not summer yet, so you're probably under one year. There's a really good chance that you'd be able to go back and and bring in action against the seller. Sounds like they might have um, misrepresented the property, hidden hidden the defects. You know, there was a problem. They knew about it. They covered it up, didn't tell you, and crossed their fingers and hope you wouldn't find out. So I would check with my local lawyer and ask how long you've got to sue the seller for lying to you uh, when you bought. So that's that one. Now, Neil, home inspections. What's your take on home inspections as a as a piece of diligence to do or not do? Uh, highly recommended because again, it's something that we don't, as buyers, like Andrew said, we're focused on trying to explain how, especially in creative, how an agreement for sale deal works and, and how the process is going to go forward and make sure that that's understood. The uh, property itself is a whole other issue. I mean, if the property is even brand new from a builder, I have known people who have gotten home inspections done on their brand new properties, even midway through construction and right at just prior to possession or at possession. Because again, quite frankly, other than if you are an expert in the trade and you understand contracting generally in construction, you might be an electrician who doesn't understand a plumbing issue or vice versa. So highly recommended. We've gotten to the point where we stopped paying for the actual inspection by the company because, you know, this is apparently how long we've been doing. We used to get the very thick binder with all the pre-printed things from the inspection company. We started saying we don't need that level of, of um, template and um, boilerplate stuff already printed off. We just need to know what am I, what do I need to address? What am I might be looking at? So we were able to hire someone who had some experience in the inspection business. Um, have we brought a property without doing an inspection? Yeah. Is it recommended? Not really. So, I mean, in the hot markets, I have friends in Ottawa right now. And I mean, for the last three years, if a property is listed for sale, the inspectors there are getting paid to inspect the same property up to five times if five offers are getting put in so that a buyer can make a condition free offer to a seller rather than put, you know, in a more traditional market where they can put in a subject to finance and subject to inspection. In a hot market, you have to put in darn near condition-free offers. And so inspectors are getting paid multiple times to inspect the same property. It may not be the same company, but the same house might get five or 10 inspections prior to being sold. So, I mean, it's definitely something that if you have the confidence level because you have a background in it, uh, the analogy would be, 
you know, I, I worked for years in the automotive industry and we would tell every one of our friends, if you were going to buy a car privately, um, the cheapest insurance that you can buy prior to buying that is a pre-purchase inspection done at a reputable mechanic or garage, or even again, someone who has some knowledge of vehicles and can do it for you in their driveway. But if you don't look at it, I've seen way too many people who have gotten burned buying a vehicle from Kijiji that had all kinds of latent and patent defects that they could not identify any of them or just known issues with a particular brand and model of car that got them into trouble down the road. So houses are no, di are no different. They're manufactured, there's moving pieces, there's wear, there's depreciation. And so, yes, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> typical Neil. One word answer turns into multiple sentences. Wayne, Wayne, what are you, Wayne, you're looking like that. That's how you were looking. Muted. Sorry. Uh, someone, someone was complaining about scratching. Uh, it, it, is there, a, she said it was hard to hear you because uh, it might be all. Oh, it's probably your uh, headset. My microphone. Okay. So yeah, I'm it's probably up again. It was, it was hard for bad her to posture. hear. Bad posture. Apologies. Is that better? <laughs> That's I better. Can still hear yeah. hitting here. Rubbing on the out. collar. All right. Yeah. So I think the. I, I need to get a professional setup like Wayne has. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't he look professional? Look at him. Got his jacket on. He's got his designer tee. My goodness. And me, I'm so using an old so school wired BlackBerry headset. Yep. Yeah. So, so folks, on, on inspections, helps. I think that the standard line is that you should you should always seriously consider getting a, a home inspection. You should seriously consider whether it's a single family home or whether it's a condo or whether it's some larger structure. You should always consider. Uh, getting an inspection. Uh, sometimes we don't get inspections. If if it's a quick closing, if it's uh, you know going to be a major uh, fix and flip where you're ripping everything out anyway, maybe you wouldn't get an inspection. Although that doesn't necessarily tell you what uh, what's under the drywall. Andrea, what do you think about inspections? Uh well, like Neil, I think it's uh, a good idea. And then just to maybe shed a little bit more light on specialized inspections that you may want. Uh, so for example, if you have a preserved wood foundation, you will need a, a specialized person, an engineer for that. Uh, when it comes to buying acreages, rural, when you're looking at wells and um Septic tanks, those are also things that uh, you want to make sure you have good, clean water and there's no bacteria in it and that your septic system is working properly. So there's certainly cer specialized um, inspections for specialized things. So that's something that you need to keep in mind as well. A couple of other ones in that category, I'm glad you mentioned that, Andrea, are uh, radon. Radon is a, a radioactive gas that uh, can collect in a home, can come up through the ground and collect. It, uh, it's a nasty gas. It causes cancer. Uh, it shows up uh, around Canada uh, in measurable and serious quantities in many places or hardly at all and it's and it's not an issue so you can you can get you can buy radon gas test kits on the internet that don't cost too much money uh, you could probably do some research before you went and spent the money to find out whether or not radon is an issue in your area so you can, you can do research and find out about that and then uh if there's um if there is if the home is heated by wood there's a, an inspection called the letters are W E T T, Wood yeah, Energy wet. Technology, something transfer maybe, a mm -hmm. wet inspection. Yeah, which is funny when it's all about fire, but uh, nevertheless. So there, there's four specialized uh, bits of inspecting that you could do depending on what kind of a property you're buying. Jean and Corinne Grandcourt say try to find an inspector who can estimate repairs. Not many do. That's true. Has contractor experience. Quite a few do. It helps give a more thorough inspection report and some practical application. Uh, John, I agree, I agree with that. Um, it's 
if your inspector says, well, uh, you know, this is wrong and that's wrong and something else is wrong, it's great if your inspector also has enough experience to, to be able to say, oh, you want to know how much that'll cost? And then from a position of knowledge, they can give you a rough estimate of what they think it'll cost to repair the deficiency. Otherwise, you've got to go hire other tradespeople to, to figure that out for you. And it slows up the process. And so it's way more convenient. Yeah. What else do Grant and Corrine say? Also check local real estate purchase agreement terms. Sometimes they highlight specific issues in the area. Tainted soil requiring a basement fan. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. Local knowledge, folks. Local knowledge. We're, we're talking to people all across Canada. And we four in Alberta are from an Alberta perspective. But the, the things that we're talking about, the issues that we're talking about, will come up to a large extent, no matter where you are. And so what you get, what you have to figure out is how they get handled in your area. So that's uh, that's what you have to understand. Here's another uh, specialized, uh, not really an inspection, but diligence thing, Barry, is condo or strata docks. Uh, if you're buying your first or fifth and you're still not comfortable in reading condo financial statements and AGM minutes and meeting minutes, you can actually hire a condo doc reader who will go through and review all of the the, the documents to let you know, you know, uh, for real or investors rather, one of the things I think a lot of people want to know these days is about short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. Can I make this into an Airbnb as one of my possible exit type strategies or usage type strategies with it? And I know that uh, that can be a deal breaker for some people that they're not aware of till they've bought. The other thing is um, there's actually a, a lady here in Airdrie who became a condo doc reader because she bought a condo townhouse in a complex where we are not understanding what the documents were all about and realtor didn't recommend it. And the short version was, was that we ended up with a um, cash call special uh, assessment to the tune of, I think $11,000 that had been identified um, in the, if, if, if she had had someone read them, she would have been able to see it coming that it, it actually said in, I can't remember whether it was the meeting minutes or in the auditor's report that says, you know, the state of, of the, the funds of the corporation are coming. I read my own docs now, but I mean, for the first couple ones, I mean, like, uh, we never read them on our first town. No. And we ate that 11 grand, but we were fortunate that, you know, we didn't want to, but it didn't sink us. But in some cases it, it could sink people, right? Yeah. Right. You know, it could, and, and that special assessment could be way, 11,000 is a big number. You never want to eat anywhere near that amount, but it can be way more than that. There are 50, 60, $80,000 assessments going on, uh, and they're, and that's common. That isn't even something you, you rarely see. So, so yes, uh, here in Alberta, yeah. there are a number of companies whose only business it is, is to read the condominium documentation, the bylaws, the minutes of the annual general meeting, the board meetings, the reserve fund studies, plans, and reports, all of which are aimed at giving you, the buyer, uh, a really good idea of the financial and other status of the condominium corporation before you sign up to become a, a, an owner with a bunch of other owners. So, yeah. Uh, if you ever both yeah. Google search Alberta condominium stucco failure. <laughs> yes. And we'll tell you, about you will have a hurry. lot of reading. I, every time I drive around and see another big condo building with scaffolding all around it and enclosed in, you know that the building envelope has failed and they're ripping off the whole outside, ripping off the stucco and the insulation and redoing it at a huge expense. So, uh, folks, who knew we were not going to get out of the basics? And there's more to, there's more to talk about on the basics. I got a few more things I want to talk about. I think I didn't I people coming. 20% of my list. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're at six o'clock. I think we've got at least another, another full session in here, maybe another full session to finish the basics before we move on to the creative side. But all of these things we're talking about um, are important for buying a property, whether you're buying it to add to the long-term um, portfolio or whether you're buying it because you're, you know, fix and flipping or joint venturing or RTOing or whatever other creative strategy uh, you might apply. So uh, there's lots and lots more to talk about. So we're going to bring this back. Donna's giving me a note saying, 
we have to do another session on this. And and so we'll uh, we'll schedule another session. I think we'll do it fairly quickly because I want people to kind of remember what we've done. We have, uh, I think, one or two sessions lined up for the next couple of Mondays. But uh, we're going to schedule another due diligence session soon. And come back and, and learn more about, here's a little tidbit. Learn more about when you get a nice, clean, real property report and compliance that says all the inspections have been done and there are no issues or difficulties, um, that all of that information wasn't based on fact and it wasn't true. Whoa. Cliffhanger. <laughs> Leave you with that one. Yes, Wayne. Yeah, Donna asked me to clear something up as well. Um, there's been a bunch of people asking and requesting to join your student success group on Facebook. They see the group, they're like, I want to be a part of that. However, uh, that student success group on Facebook is reserved for past students, students who have taken the focus workshops in the past, right? That's correct. To be in that student group, you have to have uh, taken one of our courses or purchased one of our online courses. You have to actually be a student. Yeah. So that's a private group. You have to have taken a course. This group is a public group. Um, you just get to show up and listen to this. But the student group is uh, kind of at a higher level because people have taken courses. It's a different conversation. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, if you want to be in that group, folks, sign up for one of my courses. And then you're right in there like a dirty shirt, like with everybody else. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. On that note, I want to uh, thank uh, Andrea, who I know has a very busy life now that she's got 12 professional designations and she's just ripping around doing everything. And and Wayne, who's got lots going on, even though he thinks he's only being in his office there. He's got more going on than that, folks. Don't let him kid you. And Neil, of course, is traveling around the country and trapped on Vancouver Island. Poor baby. Can't get back to Airdrie. Yeah. We'll uh, order pizza for you, Neil, or something like that. So well, we're trying to see guys. if there's maybe some fix and flip opportunities out here, Barry. Yes. Ooh. Yeah, find some. We can do a we do a cooperative fix and flip. So thanks, everyone. I always appreciate it when you guys show up. We'll do another one of these. Good night, everyone. We'll catch you up next time. Night.